you should be able to play whatever you hear. And if you're listening to something, you you over probably repeated listening, listening uh, you should be able to understand and reproduce what you're hearing. I had a wonderful time chatting with this interesting young French artist. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting today with Céline saint And Céline is an Afro-French bassist, singer, and composer with Caribbean and West African origins. She's been going back and forth between Paris and New York and has been studying with Ron Carter, Lonnie Plaxico, Steve Coleman, and many other people. We dig into what her career has been like so far, her travels, explorations in the U.S. and in Paris, and what she's up to musically. And you'll also hear some music from her, from her composition, Mare Udnaram. I had a great time chatting with her. Can't wait to sit down with her for a round two in the future. I know you're really going to enjoy this. And a quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Texas Hill Country Bass Collective, and A440 Violin Shop. More on them later. But let's get into this conversation with Céline Santami. Now, I got to ask, uh, are you playing on a, a Patrick Chartone bass? Yes, wow. I am. Wow, that is, that is so cool. Is that the B2? Or what is the, what is the bass that you're playing on? Uh, so the name of this bass is a suit bass. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's it's a kind of, I think it's two years old, probably, or a little more than that. Uh, actually, I've heard uh, I've heard a podcast of uh, Patrick talking about about it uh, yeah. on your on your channel. Oh, you heard? Okay, okay, that's great. Yeah, he and I met for the first time a couple of years ago at the International Society of Bassists, and and he okay. he had that suitcase bass with him, and it was like watching a, a science fiction project or something, <laughs> you know, just watching it go in. So you're you so what's it seems like such a cool instrument. Uh what's the what's the experience like using it? Um well I'm it I it took some time to get used to it because um the the, the way you put all the pieces together is very easy, mm -hmm. but at first it takes it takes, you know, a little uh, like the habit. So now now it it took me about one or two weeks and, and, and now I'm I can fold it and unfold it very easily. Uh, so that was uh, no, that's a, that's a great instrument. I'm very happy I, I got it, and um, it sounds very well. It sounds well with the bow or, and and in pizzicato. It's practical, and I don't know. It's it's just to me, it's the one of the best instruments that I've that I've seen from the, the this century. From this 21st century, it's, it's great. It, it, well, I just love how he really is like reimagining everything about the bass, you know, like, like what is what in the bass is is just tradition that's just aesthetics and it doesn't have anything to do with the sound production, right? I mean, you know, like even down to the F-hole shapes and everything. And I just think it's brilliant. Watch it. It reminds I, I have a folding bike. I have a Brompton folding bike. And I remember when I got it, it took me like <laughs> 10 minutes to fold it up. And now it's like 19 seconds or something. Yeah. But, but it's, it's similar. Like, I remember there's like a lever you step on and the, the end pin comes in or something like that. And the neck, the neck block, there's like a joint there, right? And the neck folds down. So Am I getting that right? Yeah. Kind of? Okay. And and what's great about it is he, he worked with the, the tension of the strings in order to make everything hold together. Mm -hmm. And that that that's was a brilliant idea. And I can't think of anybody else who did it. So he's, he's very creative, and he's really thoughtful of of the musicians. And is yeah. I mean, I'm just full of compliments with with with, with this Lucier. Okay, it's it's great and, to hear and that. Really Ten minutes away from my house. Oh, so that's, that's great too. <laughs> that's so cool that he's that close. You're the first person I've talked to who's actually been using it on gigs. So I, I've been such a fan of of his instruments, and I've seen you know the various models. But um, that's really cool that 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 you're loving it and you're using it. We're, and and so t so maybe uh, and you grew up you grew up in France. Yeah, in France. T tell me about your, uh, how'd you get into music? How'd you get into bass? What did you start playing when you were a little kid? Uh, just tell me about I your... Don't know. 
No, no, <laughs> not when I was a kid. I started playing bass in 2012. Really? Wow. Yes. So uh, just a little bit before I turned 18. And I was, I grew up in the, in a town um, close to the, 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 Fontainebleau, I don't know if you heard of this. It's, it's a very historical place in, in France because they have a, a castle and all that. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in, in a small village in the middle of the forest. And close to this village, there was this other village where Django Reinhardt uh, spent the end of his life and, and died. So there's still a, a big community of musicians and, and, and gypsies uh, and from the Reinhardt family. They still live there. And so every year they have a, a festival and it was a, just a beautiful experience. There were a lot of musicians, everybody was jamming. So it was mainly focused on, on gypsy jazz. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like this name, but on this kind of guitar, it was very centered on guitar and, 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 and just a great, great place, really. Wow. So that's how wow. I discovered music because my parents used to go and we, we, we would just, stay around, listen to music, uh, and people jamming and, and stuff like that. So that's, that's how I, f I found out about music really. So, yeah. so what, what got you started on the bass? Was it, there was like a specific moment? Uh, I would assume so. Or you, like, how did you, uh, how did you end up going down that path? Um, I think I was kind of always an, attracted to the, the, the low register and, um, I just, like the the fact that this instrument was unusual and 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 and, and weird looking and <laughs> I was I was attracted to this and it just happened. I mean, I, I, it was a kind of a crazy idea because I was not a musician at all, not not from a music musician uh, family. So I just wanted to try, and that that's it. Yeah. Wow! But then you ended up going to music school. Yes. I did um, a little bit in Paris um, and I went to a music school and at the conservatory at the same time. So I was studying um, improvised music and classical at the conservatory. And was that with, I know you've, I know you've uh, had an association with Steve Coleman. Oh right? yeah, yes. Was that wh where did you meet Steve Coleman, and and w was that at at the conservatory or after that? I mean, or? Uh, it was during during that time where I was studying in Paris. He, he's um he's doing a lot of residencies and he goes to a lot of places around the world doing outreach uh, uh, activities, uh, workshops, and stuff like that. So he was giving a workshop. Uh, in the suburbs of Paris, um, in a place called Café La Pêche in Montreuil, mm -hmm. he was giving workshops. Uh, it was incredibly cheap. I, I couldn't. Re I didn't believe it. It was like, wow, that's incredible. It was like a few bucks a, a day. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go, and um, it was a it was a life changing experience because the way. First of all, I think I've never really interact with any musician from from America from the United States so that was a, a, a incredible opportunity to be able to talk and learn from directly from these people not just from recordings and, and he has also um, a, a past with uh, uh, masters so so that's 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 the very interesting thing about it and he was giving this workshop it was it was a weird moment because this workshop started with doing a transcription of a solo of Sonny Rollins on All the Things You Are. And I thought that was one weird thing to do because it was something like 40 people in a room and he just looped that first chorus on transcribe and said, well, now we have to transcribe it. And a lot of people left. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I was I was very interested in, in, in this way of, of working, so I, I stayed and it was like ten people at the end, something like that. <laughs> so how do you how are you collectively transcribing something? That's fascinating. And, and were you were you all like doing it on your own or were you kind of working through it as a group? How 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 did that work? Uh, we were 
mainly listening and then singing along and then playing it on the instrument. Mm. It was mainly saying how important working on ears was mm -hmm. and um, that you should be able to play whatever you hear. And if you're listening to something, you, you over probably repeated listen, listening, uh, you should be able to understand and uh, reproduce what you're hearing. So that, that was the, the message. And yeah, but he could have just say this, just work on your ears, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the workshop lasted four hours. <laughs> wow. So that was a, a really interesting moment. And I realized how serious, uh, how serious he was, and they and and the people in his band were about about just about working on ears. So that that was a message, and I I never really understood that before. I mean, I knew you know yeah, of course you know you have to work on your ears, but but that was I mean, if you you know willing to spend four hours with forty people. Working on ears and just transcribing something, I mean, that's it, it maybe that it's really, 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 really important. So that, that and, and the people in this band were transcribing it at the same time. So they were all discovering the solo and everybody was, you know, kind of working on it. So I, I like that kind of workshop vibe. And it was, it was just very interesting. Do you always start when you're transcribing something? Because I know you've got a YouTube video up of you, like, play, uh, is, it, is it Cannonball Adderley? You're singing and playing, <laughs> yes. right? Um, do, you, do you, when you're transcribing something, do you si always sing it first? Yes, yes, yeah. I, I always sing it first. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I, think, um, I think my, I think my, like, again, my, like, like classical back, like, like that's something I don't all, I should, okay, today when I practice, I'm going to start singing things more. Cause that's something I, you know, I, I recently interviewed, um, I haven't put it out yet, but a, a wonderful bassist, uh, also from France named Olivier Babaz. He lives in Montreal uh, now. And he, I don't know if you ever checked out any of his, of his playing. Have I have, you, I have. It's impressive, what, right? Yeah, he's he's totally fat. For folks who don't haven't haven't listened, you should definitely check out Olivier Babaz. Um, but he has, um, yeah, he has this arco jazz approach, and, and and it's just so fascinating. And I notice as I'm listening, it's not always that obvious, but he's always singing along, kind of like uh, Slam <laughs> Stewart, one of those people. It's not necessarily as loud as that, but I know, and I never, I didn't ask him about it. Next time I talk to him, I will. But I noticed that he's and had so many jazz musicians have that as well um well they, they used to have it in the in the so-called classical music because i remember a story of beethoven saying i think he's, he was writing a letter to someone saying well i, I will have to from now on I, I think i will have to write more of my music because i've seen someone at my window uh trans transcribing and writing my compositions <laughs> so now I have to do it first, write it first, and 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 so I can protect my music. That's funny, and that sounds like Beethoven—a very ornery, sort of suspicious kind of kind of guy. That. <laughs> yes. Wow. So I, I thought that that was interesting. So it, it's a proof that people were doing it. I mean, people have been doing it. Yeah. So. Wow. No, not, nothing new. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Upton Bass, and have you checked out this new travel bass from Upton? Oh my goodness, what a cool looking design. What a great sounding bass. It's just totally remarkable, and the way that they're launching this product. It's just so perfectly upped in. It's uh, bold. It's innovative. You got to check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding. I don't even know how you describe it. Putting together, I guess, this travel base. It takes almost no time. It is in a Samsonite piece of luggage. I kid you not. It is just the suitcase. It is literally a suitcase base, but it comes together and it's a real bass. It's a nice sounding bass, so cool. Just another example of the way in which Upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the bass community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. <laughs> 
This episode is brought to you by the Texas Hill Country Bass Collective. Join them July 22nd through July 25th for their sixth annual Austin Bass Workshop. Come join friends from the area for four days of music, bass, and fun and work with 2019 featured guest artist and former podcast guest Dennis Whitaker. Learn more at TexasHillCountryBassCollective.com. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. They're always happy to assess bases for trade-in, consignment, or even purchasing outright. Contact them to schedule a time to discuss your base and your future needs. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BaseViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Well, so after that four-hour workshop with Steve Coleman, I mean, you, you continued to have some contact with him, though, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I went to, since I, I was in New York, I had the opportunity to kind of uh, get in touch more with his concept, the way he was talking about music and and. and, and uh, He's doing a lot of workshops in, in the United States, so I, I, I think, it, yeah, it was in, in, in Los Angeles at the Blue Whale because he was doing a residency, a two-week residency. So I went, I went there, and he was doing two weeks, no, maybe one week, I, I can't remember. But it, he was doing a lot of workshops, so every, every time there's a, a workshop kind of thing, I, I would go and, and sit there and listen and try to, try to understand the message and... and and try to see what was happening, and and also the the level of other musicians around around the United States. Mm-hmm. So that that's 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 interesting, and see the interaction with the band members and stuff like that. That's that's very good for sure, for sure. Now New, New York, how uh, how did you find yourself spending so much time in New York? I know you were studying with Ron Carter, or have been spending some time with Ron Carter. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, no, how, no, okay. You, how, right. how, how how did that uh, how did that unfold for you? So um, I guess it was two meetings with musicians that 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 told me, oh, you, you should you should be trying to go to New York. I mean, you know, it's, it's like the best music and, and you, should, you should be going. And so I just decided to go. And I met few few musicians where I was studying. I was not in a school or anything like that. So I was going in and out the country mm-hmm. uh, in order to, to, to take the best out of it and then go back to Paris and, and practice and, and all that. So, so I, I was, uh, yeah, I, I studied a little bit with Ron and uh, I went to one of his concerts I think he was playing the jazz standard, and um, at the end, I came to say, "Oh, I really enjoyed the concert. I would love to study with you." And and so that's that's how mm-hmm. it worked out. And he's been a great teacher, fascinating and really very serious, very uh, he's really about the tradition and the discipline and all that. So that that that's it was very helpful. Yeah. I didn't really yeah. had. Uh, steady teacher so I was kind of taking the best of every good bass players in New York mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was good yeah now you recently did your first trio gig as a band leader did I see that online <laughs> yes. the trio so mm, I'm experiencing uh, experimenting uh, on some music that I wrote recently and I just put out this this combination I, I just wanted to try it for for a trio uh, and it, it was it was a good experience I, I really the, the the drummer playing is also playing tambour mm. the tambour from, from Guadeloupe mm-hmm. so I kind of have this I guess slight Caribbean vibe to it and and then we, I, I was playing with a tenor saxophone playing bass and singing. And I was also trying for the first time um, lyrics. I mean, not really lyrics, but I wrote poems. 
and I was experimenting how this would work out with music. Uh, yeah, so okay. just trying things out before I set up a, a, a real recording yeah. and, and stuff like that. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, what else? What else have you got uh, coming coming up? And what what other avenues you're exploring? Any other? So you've got this trio, and you're trying the different combinations and playing and singing. What else are you experimenting with uh, these days in terms of musical combinations? So the the my main idea since the beginning was to work with a string trio as um, bass, cello, and and viola. That was my, my, that's my dream band and, and percussions. That's my dream band. So I would love to head in this di- direction. Um, I just have to find the right people and, and, yeah. um, and have people being available, which is not easy <laughs> these days. <laughs> uh, so that I'm, I'm working toward this. Uh, I, I really want to experiment with strings. Uh, I discovered this kind of string sound uh, working um, at the orchestra, um, at the conservatory, at the conservatory orchestra. Where, where I had a session and we were doing partials, um, partial strings, and the, the violins were doing their own partials, and we were mixed with viola, cello, and contrabass. And I really, really enjoyed the sound of 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 these three instruments, and, and that's how I decided that I wanted to head in, in this string direction. I can't, I can't wait to hear what that string direction sounds like. That's really exciting. And it's, it's, it's so fun. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting how um, you can, uh, how, how mu- you think you've got these instruments that have been around for hundreds of years, but it's amazing how much undiscovered t- sonic territory there is in these instruments. There's, there's still much ground to explore um, with, with a trio or solo bass or what have you. And, and uh, I'm just a fan of, of what I've seen so far following along with what you're doing. I think it's really interesting. And I think your approach to the bass is really, really cool. And I, I can't wait to see what the next projects are. Well, I, I, I was lucky enough to, to meet very good bass players that kind of helped me um, getting a, the, I don't know if I should say right approach, but the, a, a good approach to uh, working on the bass, practicing uh, you know, just very good tips of, of, of everything around the bass, fingerings, and the way we should work on the right hand, the left hand, and, and stuff like that. So that was, I mean, this all comes from, from people who, who were very helpful. And mostly in, 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 in the people I met in the United States, um, like, like Lonnie Plexico um, is a, a Brooklyn-based bass player. And he was very helpful showing me a lot of stuff, talking about, you know, the history of the music and all that. So very good people who are willing to share information. And that's what, you know, helps me in, in the end to kind of find my own voice around around this. So I'm just, you know, starting to find my, my own voice. But that, that, that was very helpful. Well, a, a lot of people that listen to this podcast are picking up the bass. They're adult amateurs, and they're going to be yelling at me if I don't ask you this. But like, what? Give it. Give me some example. Of like, what did Lonnie Plaxico or anybody like in terms of some of the specifics? Like, uh, what what exercises did you discover? What do you do to? What did you do? Because I mean, how cool! Like, you're you're nearly eighteen, and you pick up the bass, and now you've got this. You've got this career. Uh, you know, this really interesting career building for yourself. So surely you got some good advice to, to get to where you are. Um, what, what, uh, what were some, what are some things you do on the base on a daily basis or what are some of the things you remember from Lonnie or anybody along the path? Um, well, the first thing was to, I mean, I, I'm not quoting anybody now because I'm, I'm, I don't want to say wrong things and or <laughs> sure. things that they may have said. So I'm just going to say whatever comes to mind. Um, probably just be comfortable with the instrument by hold, holding it right. And and just be comfortable and work a little bit every day if you can. Uh, what else can I say? I mean... Um, 
Do you, like, do you work with the bow on a daily basis or does the bow not play into it so much for you or? No, the bow is still a kind of a routine, you know, practice on, on scales with the bow. It's, it's to work on, on pitches and, and to be able to, you know, just find the right pitches. Um, so I, when I, I work uh, with the bow, I always have a, a, t- a tuning, uh, a tuner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I spend just a long, a lot of time just, you know, playing pitches and, and just making sure that they're right. Not almost right, but right. Yeah. yeah. And um, I had a very good advice from, from Mr. Carter. Uh, we were say, was saying uh, something about the volume you practice on, the volume mm-hmm. and respect the mm-hmm. a, a right volume and, and make sure that you can manage how to, to work around that and, and also the, the length of the notes you're playing. And that that was that was surprising. I've never heard of anybody saying that. So, I, you know, he was telling me your your notes. You have to make sure that they have a certain length, and you don't want to overdo it or do it less. So you have to be really, you know, centered the, the way you play a note. Hi, my name is Andres Martin. I'm an Argentinian composer and double bass player living in Tijuana, Mexico. I play in a professional orchestra, also teaching and performing as a soloist in festivals around the world. After trying almost every string set in the market for the last 20 years, I found Kaplan string to be the only ones that can allow me to use all the different colors and techniques I've been working at during my entire career. I use both solo and orchestral sets, and I love the tone, tension, thickness, and the wide range of dynamics and harmonic resonance and timbre I can get with them. For me, they have the perfect balance between thickness and flexibility, making them a true pleasure under my fingers and bow. I'm happy that finally I have a set that makes me happy when I have to play in any situation. Every violin shop has its own unique origin story. And here's A440's Michael Spadero on how the shop got started. My mother-in-law started this business in 1982, and she was a professional cellist. But uh, the story she told me was that Camille, my sister-in-law, is a uh, violinist with the L.A. Phil. Mm-hmm. And when she was maybe in high school, her violin was being repaired in a shop. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, the shop owner had some legal problem more like the Cook County Sheriff or someone confiscated all the stuff okay so the only reason the only way for my mother-in-law to get her daughter's violin back was to buy all the contents of the shop at a police auction okay wow. so <laughs> since she had all these instruments i think that's what initially made her start a shop it's a great shop i've gone there for years and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast michael and folks check them out at a440 dot com. That's an interesting observation. You know that that's something that I, I I've I've heard uh, in in you know uh, conservatory and like uh, classical lessons and that sort of thing. Um, people te- uh, and I I haven't heard it applied to like a jazz context, but it totally makes sense. You know, people talk a lot about the beginning of the note, but they don't talk enough about the end of the note. How does the note end? Where does it end? And maybe maybe he, maybe that's sort of along those lines. It sounds like. Yes, I, I've I've always heard. Uh, I mean, my classical teacher uh, back when I was in, at the conservatory was really talking about the length of the bow and you know all all these very nerdy kind of <laughs> stuff on on the bow and and how you you know you produce a sound and and you know you do what's written on the paper and all that. So uh, and I've never heard of of, of of any bass players who really just mentioned it on the pizzicato approach and but it it, it really makes sense yeah. so and just having a, a clean sound and and being able to produce the right sound and project and um yeah and and working on 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 the feel and how do you do you want to play your notes and, and stuff like that that, that doing a little bit every day is such an important thing for people to grasp. That's something that I, I've struggled with my, my whole adult life. I've been using this app recently ca- called Modacity for practicing, and it keeps track of how many days in a row you've practiced. And if you break your streak, you're back to zero. So I don't want to break my streak. And so, 
<laughs> it's so good though. It's like that one little thing's like, ah, oh, I don't want to go back to zero. So I, I have pulled my bass out and made myself go through things. And I think I'm only going to play five minutes. I ended up playing 20 minutes. I ended up um, being glad I did. So how, whatever you need to do to, to keep that consistency, that's just so like uh, unbelievably important in my experience. Yeah, consistency is, is very important. Otherwise, you you may have reached a point where you you know you you pretty good and then you stop and then you go back down i mean just like your app says mm-hmm. you know if you if you go back to if you don't practice for a few days i mean for just one day i guess you, you, your app says you're going back to zero mm-hmm. it's not i mean it's kind of what it is in in, in in real life you know if you just don't keep up with what you you learn you you lose it yeah you know yeah that just update just like yeah. all the apps they ask us to update all the time so we have to update the, the brain as yeah. well <laughs> you know, it's, that's a great observation yeah, it's like i've heard a description of keeping the blade sharp or um there's a wonderful bassist in the los angeles philharmonic named david moore and he talks about it uh he calls it musical hygiene we have to like do the musical equivalent of brushing our teeth every day you know just yeah. to keep to keep 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 the machine working right and keep things in focus i i remember um a one somebody approached me at the end of a concert to to give lessons and i don't really give lessons uh so i was i was telling him well i don't really give lessons i, I i'm not you know i'm i'm, I'm still uh, studying and I, i'm still trying to get better i don't want to give lessons now you know it doesn't make sense and he was like oh, gee, i'm just a real beginner i just want to you know i just have a bass home i really want to play stuff so can you show me so i finally agreed and 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 I remember this person was saying, yeah, but it's difficult for me to, you know, practice every day. I mean, maybe I can just, you know, learn during the lesson and then that's it. It's like, then I'm not sure I can do it because you're not going to make progress and you, you know, you, it doesn't make sense. That's a frustrating student to take on too, especially if you're not doing a lot of teaching. <laughs> you don't want that. That's, <laughs> you want the, you want the people that are hungry and, and yeah. Hungry. Yeah. It's just like apply. You could you could apply it to anything else in life. Like oh, I don't want to work out. It's like if I just work out, you know, when I'm in my physical. Yeah, during- <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. Now you got to do it every. Yeah, so it's a good hard lesson to learn. It's that it's like pushing that boulder every day just a little bit. And it's tough when you're on the road, uh, uh, like like trying to maintain some consistency, you know. And you at least you have the suitcase base, so you can pack it up, and you you have a little more flexibility, probably. But still, if you, you go like when you were going back and forth between New York or other travels, the the road can be a real um, consistency killer, yeah. creativity killer, unless you like learn how to master it. Well, the, the 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 good thing about the base is, I mean, this base that I have here is is really that I can just take it everywhere with me. So that was one of the main thing because I knew I was traveling a lot, and each time I was traveling somewhere, I would never really had an instrument or would borrow someone's. And, you know, it would always be complicated. And the time I was in Cuba, I found the base, but it was, you know, I had to give it, give it back on a certain date and stuff like that. It's, oh, it's always complicated. But I always found people willing to help and stuff like that. But you don't really feel comfortable just barring your whole, you know, the, your whole life barring people's stuff, you know. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that, that, that why, that's why I, I took this base as well. So I, I went to, to Morocco last month and... I found myself able to meet different people, just, just take the bass on the train with me on my back. And, and that was it, you know? So I, thanks to this bass, I met many different people that I would have probably never meet or, um, I mean, I would have met them, but n- never been able to play with them. Just, just sit there and listen, which is great. But once you, if you can interact in real life with your instrument, it's, it's much better. Yeah. Wow, Morocco! What was that like? I, I I would love to go there someday. But what were you playing, or were you just sort of taking in the music, or what were you doing? I was I was performing, and I took some time to to study the Gnawa culture. So I stayed there two weeks. So I, I really had a, a bit of time to, you know, to, to to study and and perform as well. But the the, the Gnawa culture is incredible, and the history of it is is. Is huge. I mean, I'm interested in the the musics from from the African diaspora, and 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 so from from all around the world. There's you know, it's very spread out. So the, 
the so-called jazz, I mean, the African-American tradition and the music from the Caribbean, from Cuba, from Martinique, Guadeloupe, and all these places, and then Brazil and stuff like that. So it's, it's just great to see how how one big place can just turn out to, to, to have so many different cultures, but they also have uh, a common root. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's what I, I like. And I try to visit these places and, and learn from them. Well, it's so, so cool. I can't wait to hear where you go to next. And, you know, going back to that suitcase base, which I know everybody's going to be, Patrick will be thrilled we're talking about it so much, but I think it's such a cool, <laughs> such a cool thing. Um, you know, I was, ta- I was chatting for the podcast with Larry Grenadier uh, maybe two years ago or something like that. And we were talking about, you, you know, it's tough to borrow an instrument anywhere, no matter what type of music you're playing. But there's, a, I think, a unique challenge to borrowing an instrument when you're working in an improvised form. Format. Because like like that that worrying about where the notes are or like like you want to have that freedom and you want to have that comfort to be able to explore and if you and and I got to think that that gets shut off a little bit if you're fighting the string height or if you're playing you're, if it's a half inch longer than what you're on and so uh, the the having something that that is just yours that's the same dimension that responds the same way that's got the strings you like it's got to just make uh your musical explorations easier flow better yeah it's just comfortable yeah being comfortable Selene, thank you so much for chatting with me. And folks, check out more about her on her website. We've got that all linked up in the show notes and social media and all that kind of good stuff. I love doing these podcasts to meet people like Selene. It's so great to chat with her, whether it's remotely like we did or to sit down with over 30 people. What? Like I just did at the International Society of Basis Convention in Indiana, or at rather, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Such a great time. Thank you if you were there and checked it out. And especially if you came up and said, hi, I love meeting people who follow along with the show. And if you didn't make it, you're in for a treat because you're going to be hearing from many, 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 many folks, including Chi Chi Nuanoku, Steve Bailey, John Patitucci. I don't even know where to begin with the list. I had such a great time there, and I know you'll love following along with that. Whether or not you're at the ISB convention, if you want to reach out and say hi or suggest a guest or any of that good stuff, feedback at Contrabass Conversations will put you in touch with me, and I love hearing from people, so definitely reach out. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Both Trevor and Mitch were at the ISB convention, and Mitch Mooring won a silver medal for Tone for his latest bass. How cool is that? Learn more about Mitch and his bass work and luthery work at MitchMooring.com. Thank you also to Krista Copper for going through and archiving all that we've done on this podcast. So appreciative of that. I am your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm.